to the start of Grind. Let's talk about uh, you both as an individual. Then we talk about how people would work up for a sort of industry like this. So let's talk about founder versus funders. Yeah. So you you be bootstrap your own company, uh, and then you're coming to this side of, uh, of this side of the world. Yeah. You're part of a bigger venture, which is funding which has which has. Uh, if anyone today wants to start an e-commerce store, what would you recommend? Would you recommend that, hey, go out there, bootstrap it, start a development, you know, have, have technology in place, go, go to the vendors, so on and so forth? Or would you say, hey, you know, go to this, uh, East, this e-commerce store in China, yeah. and get them and get them to start off and then let them fund it? What would you what would you uh, recommend and what would, you, what would the role be? Yeah, so, so first of all, I guess, I guess let me just tell you a little bit about my background and then I'll, yeah. then I'll be willing well, to give some of the advice on that as well. So, uh, so listen, I mean, I, I, I paid for college myself. I went to school in the US, graduated. I had to basically get a nice job that would help me pay my college loans. Uh, ended up doing investment banking. Uh, and then sort of realized that with the downturn of the US economy, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of the entry-level work that analysts were doing on Wall Street uh, could be offshore. We started, we started to already be offshore to the likes of India and Philippines. So, uh, so, you know, so, so after a couple of years after that, I basically came back to my hometown of Samba and uh, didn't have the money to really uh, to start anything at scale. You know? So, uh, and, and I really recommend everybody you know, who doesn't have the money to just try and find out who the stakeholder is, who the important person to speak to is, you know, um, and find out what their problem is. You know, so where can they be more efficient? Where can they save more money? Um, and then, and then convince them to essentially uh, help solve that problem for them in view of some equity. Right, so basically, I came back to Pakistan and um, set up a, a, a BPO, uh, selling, selling data to an information provider. Uh, that was having trouble finding cheap data, you know? uh, and the information provider was selling data to investment banks. So investment banks in the US were laying people off, right, because they didn't have as much money as they did in the past. Right? They were relying on the information provider. The information provider had to hire cheaper people, and it was cheaper to hire people globally because of wage arbitrage, and so they had a lot of people doing stuff. Over the span of seven, eight years, we grew about 600 people. And uh, was it bootstrap? Yes, it was bootstrap. But then what I did was basically, because I didn't have my own capital, I was basically helping raise money from them, you know, to essentially fund through the fees uh, the, the, the business. And then uh, in about seven, eight years, I uh, I sold it to them. I sold it to them, stuck it around, uh, stuck around for about two years or so. Uh, and, uh, and then start thinking of something next to it. But see, here, here's the option that I have. Either I can basically take my savings and risk them all, right? Or I could keep my savings, take my ideas, go to somebody who really had money, and a lot of money, and propose an idea to them and take a, take a piece of the equity. And that's, that's, that's what I've done. And uh, yeah, that's, I, that's what I would recommend everybody to do. Because I, I uh, you know, I, I think I think my skills are execution. I'm not a pure player risk taker. You know? uh, I think there's a lot of money in this world. Um, I think you just need to speak to the right stakeholders and find a solution for them. Okay. Um, let's talk about rocket internet. In terms of how they do a lot of ventures successfully, what are the, I mean, the, the three things or you know, the five things that I like to check, 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 and this is the key formula to, to success in terms of taking this model and implementing it here and coming to this and What has actually worked for them over the past few years? Well, I think Rocket itself has done multiple models. So I think there's some model specific things and then there's some general things. So I think the way what Rocket looks at things is A, they want to go in the market, they want to be the first ones in the market. Because they feel very strongly about that a lot of these markets, the first move advantage is, is huge. Now that Amazon is so huge in, in, in the US, it's very hard for anybody to compete with Amazon and we don't know when that's going to change. So they feel very strongly about going in 
and actually scaling really, really fast. They also feel where, you know, how everybody comes out and says that, you know what, the world is very different, every market is different. Rocket's philosophy is, you know what, it's not that different. So sure, when you go out and execute stuff, certain things will be different, but people everywhere are the same. They want to buy clothes, they want to buy nice clothes, they want to eat food, they want to do everything. They're very, very similar. So that's what Rocket uses as a, as a base assumption, and then they go into every country and implement the same models, rather than worrying about whether people will think the same way or not in those countries. Obviously, when you come out to execute, so a very common reason of rocket is that there, there's no innovation, the people simply go and copy it. You know what, when you go and execute a model in another country, there may not be innovation in the business plan, but you come down to execute how you're going to work on it, there's a lot of innovation that comes in there. So. Yeah, so you know, so you look at as far as they're concerned, they look at basically where where, <laughs> the, where the mobile population is, where the internet population is, where it can grow, right? And and then essentially go out and essentially hire people who <coughs> Are smart or have a legacy of success, and uh, really give them funding and allow them to be independent, solve problems, and then benchmark their uh, performance on a monthly basis across across the world. And the important thing there also, like you said, is so Rocket does not go out and hire people from an Amazon, etc. It just hires people who they feel are have enough experience and they have a track record of being successful in whatever field they do. Because they feel if you're smart in if you're just a smart person who has some success, you can do that. It's not it's not rocket science, but you need to, as long as you pick up ideas and can roll it out, you can do it. And the obviously the important thing in any business is that we in any business to run a business, you don't have to know everything about that business, but you have to have the ability to hire the right people and get the smart people. So if there's technical expertise involved, you hire some people. You don't have to be the best in everything. And I think being comfortable with that and knowing that in certain areas, people in your company know more than you is a very big part of running any business with that, not just startup. Yeah, if you think about e-commerce, like, you know, so what innovation did Alibaba do? None. You know, they took a model that was working in, in, in the West and basically sort of like customized it for their local audience. So everybody doesn't need to be an inventor. I'm not an inventor. Most people in this room are not inventors. If you're an inventor, go make a software, you know. But uh, the core thing in this, and this is what, you know, this is what Rocket really goes out to, is it says, listen, here's a model, you know, you've got to just bundle it, structure it, you know, and then get the right people to execute it. And that's what really Apple's done as well. Like, think about it, like, you know, Steve Jobs didn't invent anything, you know. He took pieces of inventions, created a product, and made it viable across the world. I mean, Siri on the iPhone, that's not something Apple came up with. They're the ones who actually made it very consumer friendly and very accessible to the average consumer. But it's not, it's not like they came up with that technology, right? So, you can call it innovation. It's not really innovation was going to come up with it, but you know what? They're the ones who allowed the average person to have access to it. So, so when, when we talk about cloud versus original, I think you know, we are more focused to so, so, yeah, well, yeah, or or I, 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 inspired. I think I think you know the media has just basically it's just it's just become funny to talk about it in this manner. Right? On the other hand, like if Pakistan comes out, somebody in Pakistan starts basically making a car, we will be like, oh, what an innovation. Somebody in Pakistan has made a car. It's not innovation. You know, a car was made in the 1800s, basically, in the West. So, listen, we're going to take what's worked in the best, you know, what's worked best in the world, try and structure it, you know, kind of customize it, and execute it. And, and our goal is to essentially make, you know, bring, 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 bring transformational change in the way business is done. So, Rocket is. Has, has done this so beautifully across the world. They've allowed people who would have other, not, otherwise not had the ability to have e-commerce in their countries, to essentially bring e-commerce, and, and that has fundamentally changed the way business will be done in the future in those countries. And I, and I think that's that's the beauty of it. Earlier you mentioned that there are really keep a certain percentage of equity. So are those numbers also hidden or is it shared? Yeah, yeah. What, what, what's the equity line? <laughs> They're hidden. They're hidden. <laughs> those, numbers, those numbers are also hidden. Those but, are the most hidden numbers on the table. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, Google it. I mean, Google it. This is not rocket science, right? So basically, Google it, you find out what typically, uh, you know, founders are essentially given. Okay. So what are the biggest mistakes which, which rocket didn't have made? Earlier, before they even come to Pakistan or, or, or venturing into this region, which. Yeah, so Oliver Samuel said one of the biggest mistakes he made was selling too early. Okay. Yeah. So basically, he sold 
a Lando to eBay for fifty million dollars. That's a chump change. It's six months after he started it, right? Chump yeah. change. And how do you how do you define what is early? You know, how do you say that okay, this is too early or this is too late? For example, uh, but, what's our what's our way to what was that waiting for a long time for the right time, right? Yeah. So, so, so it's you know so that way to work though. Yeah, so way too late. I, I think I think once three G is rolled out in this country and you have a sizable number of people basically on uh, with access to the internet, mm -hmm. I think that's that's the that's that's the time. And if you look at rocket strategy now, so I'm not sure if she's the largest the rocket company in the world. Is uh, this is Zalando, which is the European fashion venture. It's actually the fastest venture. They a billion euros of revenue in, in all of Europe. The first fastest company with billion euros of revenue. So they now, now when the time has come for them to, run, it's not really, they don't exit company anymore. They simply go for a bigger round of funding. So now the land of the IPO guys. So now they learn their lessons. You know what? You don't have to sell the company and, and not make a single cent from it after they've sold it off. They can still retain a very, pretty big chunk of it, and the percentage may go down, but the percentage is. Less of a much bigger overall number than they still up, up in the game. Then. Yeah, so, so like Freddie said, now, now the goal is not just to flip, but to also now it's, you know, Rocket is now has the repute to essentially raise capital, not just from private investors and private equity arms and so forth, but hopefully now from the public market, which in itself is is, is a tremendous thing. It's something you can, you know, you can raise money from everybody who's willing to invest in it. And have they done that or are they? So it's, it's going to happen. Only on the first IPO, I think, later the second half of this year, which will happen. Okay, and then it's going to follow suit with other features. Let's talk about the margins of what rocket internet charge is versus what the competition the will charge is going to be. Same thing. Well, I, to be honest, to be honest uh, ours might be higher, yeah. but uh, the thing is, we, the way we see it, so initially a lot of companies were hesitant because of our margins. Now most of them have jumped on the bad back and they're working with the exact same margins. And the whole idea is that we, the way we see it, because it's not about every percentage number makes sense at some rupee value, right? So if you have, so, so the way we see it, we give people access and potential to save and that's why they feel that they are market. Well, the biggest aspect of it is shipping, right? So basically if you're shipping, for example, uh, a 50,000 uh, rupee phone, you know, shipping is negligible, the amount is negligible, right? But if you're shipping something which is like 2,000 rupees or 1,500 rupees, you know, shipping matters, right? So you see that comes from the margin. Shipping to the chicha bhakti and collecting cash as well. The significant cost is right there. That's associated with it. So, you know, my next question would be that A, the margin is higher. How does that justify in the long run by competing with bricks and mortars? Because they can't leave, they'll get the chicha So, you guys use the same logic. No, so hang on, no, so what the thing is, right now, let's say look at the biggest brands in Pakistan, how many stores do they have? 15, 20, max, max very few with a bucket more stores in that. When they're setting up a store, they're making a significant amount of money. If you look at the amount of overhead they spend on that store, they easily come up to about 30, 40 percent of what they're making from that store. So we, in a lot of cases, are actually allowing people to, to not commit any capital up front and only pay us a certain percentage. And the second thing is, uh, that's part of it, and then we, as a company, our strength is in online marketing. Right? So we kind of marketing we can do people online. A lot of people realize that they it really helps them get they get their name out in the online market. That's also so our margin includes everything, right? So we are the way we charge right now includes your shipping, your production, your photography, etc., etc. And so that's how the margin. Makes sense. And you know what we're we're also seeing is some because initially we went to some brands and they said, oh, you know, we want to we want to sell online ourselves. We want to sell free. Like, sure. And they've come back and they see now they're trying to sell to us again, right? The reason is our core business is selling online. Right? We know this better than anybody else. So, yes, sure, people can sell online, but they're not going to get those numbers. Right? A lot of brands it's quite expensive care. as well. People don't realize this running in e-commerce store, at scale especially, is a very expensive. You know, and I think the, the, compared to the offline retailer, right, there's very, one very big difference. So, in an offline store, let's say, a big lawn brand is giving someone 1%, right? They, they sell something, they make 10 rupees on it. But provided they sell 10,000 pieces a day, they will still make money on that, right? In our case, because our cost structure is, the marginal cost percent is very high. The shipping fee which we incur every single time, that varies from every single item incurring that cost. 
So we obviously cannot work on the same structure as it was, right? Because even with scale, we still putting out few hundred rupees just pushing in that product. Yeah, I mean, so there are some e-commerce models out there, some some models out there who charge a lower margin. But what they do is they throw the onus on shipping or the supply. Right? Um, that's a haphazard sort of experience. And you'll see basically that there's scores of customer satisfaction that are relatively lower. And the brand is also you know, lower in terms of recognition and local trust. If you go back to 2012, and let's say you had a chance to do it all over again, what would, we, what would, what would you again do? Would you kind of take over all those mistakes that you might have made? Nothing. I don't think, uh, obviously I haven't realized it yet. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. but uh, every day is a learning experience. You know? Maybe, maybe yeah. get into logistics faster, maybe? Or? Yeah, probably do a warehousing a lot earlier. We initially outsourced it. Bad idea. We should have done it ourselves. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, like shipping, you know, probably uh, we should have done some level of means faster uh, on our own. Um, then rely on three PLs that might be just used companies. But I think generally, I don't think we did anything wrong. Right? And uh, I think I think we we really bootstrapped our way into understanding and comprehending the market before really making that. Uh, what are the markets that you have not explored yet? Maybe because either the target market is very small, or maybe doing, or maybe the, you know, the, the cost of doing the business is much higher. Yeah, like yeah. right. 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 with the fashion, you can say it's stuff we've kind of touched upon but not really done in very large way. Maybe bridal wear, or kids, or only living for that So. Yeah, that's something that's kind of within connected to what we're doing, but we haven't really done it. Too. They're very exciting markets in general when people think about fashion, they think about like these wraps, uh, not realizing all, of, all these fashion shows that are happening in the country, they're not selling any of those clothes. What they're selling is basically bridal wear. You know, so so that's, that's a very lucrative, but it's a niche market. It's a, it's a complicated business from an e-commerce perspective. I think we'll probably slowly stage into it. Uh, I think bridal also just keep in mind if you're familiar with the sector yeah. that bridal is actually a product slash service sector because typically when someone has gone out there to spend so much money, they also like to have the experience of someone sitting down with somebody who convinces them this is the best thing for you, right? So that's how the sector is working right now. So we also we also feel that we're also essentially start moving towards our mind, but it'll be a little slower and it'll be a little later. So two last questions before I jump into the audience. Uh, a is uh, India and Japan. Which is, which is now again a rocket venture. Uh, again a rocket venture, and not only I think it has a lot more the, the portfolio of products way more than what, what you guys have. They are in radio, they are in television, they are everywhere. Uh, is that coming in soon in Pakistan uh, with with the so I talk about radio TV. Huh? Yeah. So, 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 so why 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 did you get into radio TV? Because everybody else was. So when you talk about Mantra, you talk about Flipkart, you talk about Snapdeal, everyone was on TV, right? But the market is intensely competitive in India. Um, we feel we hardly have any competitor in Pakistan. Uh, they're so small that they're hardly competitors. Um, so I guess, I'm not saying that we're not going to get into offline media. Uh, we will, but we have to no into it to an extent. Yeah. Not on a large scale, not the way we do online, but we have. But there's no dire need for that. I mean, it's not something you're saying we won't do, but we haven't felt the need as yet. But it's something you could very, very, very well see. Your yeah. first question about assortment? Assortment, well, look at this question. We have 30,000 people who on the website. I think in Tibong, we have not 70,000. But those are the extent of the population. So if you look at it from that point of view, it is. It's not, we're not so far behind. I've said that we will grow our assortment. But if you look at a Far Eastern venture, for example, a Far Eastern venture is covers about 10 countries, as well as Zalora. I think the entire assortment is over 20,000 products, not more than that in fashion. So I think assortment will be there. We obviously are growing it, but I think more than growing it, we're also trying to refine it, where we are trying to add things which people really want, and, and add things which we are so maybe certain gaps in certain subcategories, rather than simply add to the same thing. Just keep in mind, every time we add a product, it isn't a good one to have on the website. We may get someone on the website, look at that, and decide not to make the purchase involved. So we don't want to dilute our website, push up on the website with the stuff that's been. Because you have too much stuff to sift through, and you've got to make the person go through multiple filters. You know, 
which is which is two cups of coffee in the queue as well and that can work everything is really good yeah. but if you know so then you don't want people to see the stuff that's not so good or not so relevant to them and get lost in other stuff so that's why obviously there's other parts of that problem but you don't want so the assortment is not going to grow but not as fast as it has grown in the past year but I, but i do think basically you probably start seeing us uh, grow our marketing uh, as soon as 3g goes out of okay so globally uh the objective of e e-commerce is either customer acquisition or it is to you know create a brand or make sure that you are among the top of the consideration set yeah. and it, it's never i mean profitability is there it's, it's not major part of it and eventually you would wait out until either you exit from the market and cash out that yeah. or where is the raj right now is it Is it moving towards being profitable? Is it moving towards having more customer acquisition? Uh, or how, how do you? Yeah, so, so the focus right now is to acquire new customers, right? To acquire as many new customers as we possibly can. Because what we've seen is uh, when somebody becomes our customer, inevitably uh, it takes a few cycles for them to essentially become profitable for us. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think I think. The focus right now. Is but I also think, obviously, we are buying new customers with the intention of becoming profitable. Not today, but at some point in the future, right? So the whole idea is that we don't expect to be profitable at a current at a current volume. We need to get to a certain level, and acquiring customers obviously step in that direction. Value for any company is customers. WhatsApp was acquired for its customers, yeah. yeah. Not because they were raking in billions of dollars. So, uh, so that's the goal. The goal is to acquire customers. Like one last question, and I, I would like you to answer that, right? Not, not say that. Okay. So, what's the per day uh, order number like? Right yeah, so in terms of products, we sell uh, nearly a thousand products a day. Uh -huh. So, uh, yes. average average order is what? Fifteen hundred? No, it's what three thousand. Three thousand. In mind, we need the battery, but also for the accessories and customers. So that's why. But you know, the, the basket size really changed with the assortment, right? So basically, when say suddenly more uh, luxury brands are introduced, the basket changes. You have watches coming, and people start buying more watches. The basket changes. So the basket, the basket will probably uh, evolve as well. Right? 